Hello, and welcome to the Skill Cookbook Recipes series, where I show you the process of learning something new. This is one of a series of posts on coding video games with the Swift programming language. You'll be following along with some of the challenges I overcame when building a game called Forever Maze. The screenshot here is from Forever Maze, and you'll notice that it uses this, what's called, 2.5D artistic style. This means it is two-dimensional, but it kind of gives this sense of depth or this um, kind of twist to it that rotates the screen by 45 degrees. In other words, north is to the top right. This means that a tile in the game is essentially a diamond. And north is that way. Of course, calling it north, south, east, and west is somewhat arbitrary. You might also hear me refer to them as up, down, left, and right, but I think the cardinal coordinate system makes a lot of sense to talk about here. Now, what's really challenging with a 2.5D game is setting up a coordinate system that makes sense. You see, the math here gets a little bit tricky when you rotate things by 45 degrees. Also. There's the challenge that we want an infinite world. We want to be able to essentially step over one edge and continue around as if the world were circular back at the other edge without having any seams or even the player noticing that they've wrapped around the world. So in this post, we're going to be tackling this idea of creating a coordinate system for a 2.5D, also known as an isomorphic video game. So we've already taken a look here at this idea of north. So there's two ways we can think about this. If we look at the tiles as they exist on the screen, they're diamonds, as we saw in the screenshot on the intro here. But if we think about the space in terms of world space, it's a more traditional grid. Let's just say it's 100 by 100. In fact, that's the size of Forever Maze. When we're talking about this, we need to think about the difference between these two different systems. The coordinates down here are xy coordinates. But when you think about it, the positions points or pixels on the screen are also xy coordinates. So we need to differentiate between the two. And most importantly, we need to be able to convert between the two. In order to deal with coordinates, we also need to be able to do some basic math on them. For example, we're going to be able to add and subtract different coordinates together. This is one of the really cool things about the Swift programming language. If you haven't checked out the accompanying blog post to this how-to article, go ahead and click over it to, to it now because there's going to be a lot of source code I'll be referring to. In our coordinate Swift class, we actually define these primitive methods or functions that allow us to add two coordinates together. So if we have, say, let c1 equals some coordinate, and we also have a c2, we can say let c3 equal c1 plus c2. This is a very powerful feature of the Swift language, that you can actually define these methods, create your own plus operator between objects of your class. This means that the code ends up reading a lot more simply in the end. So some of the first things I set up in the coordinate class are just those basic operators. Now, one of the th things that might strike you as a bit strange about the coordinate class is that I implemented the actual x and y values in two different ways. There's the uint version, the x and y, or unsigned integer version, and this refers to the coordinate from 0 to the max, or 100 in our case. And that's what you might call the canonical form of the coordinate. 
it is the uh, actual space in the in that coordinate space. But I also have this other variable in there called index. An index is a version of those x and y values that can be negative. So it might go down to negative 10x. And this just kind of makes some math easier later on. It allows us to compare coordinates together in certain uh, places that's kind of useful when we're doing math later. So it, one way to think about this is if our max value is 100, then negative 10 x value is the same as 90 x value, or in other words, 10 back from the right edge. I hope that makes sense because it is a little bit strange to think about, but I find it useful for setting up this coordinate class. Moving on then, the next thing we're going to take a look at is how the coordinates actually are used. The first thing the coordinates will be used for is to lay out things on screen. In other words, we need to be able to convert from, from a coordinate to a position or a point on screen. This means that we'll be able to lay out our game world so that the tiles are at the right place, the objects are at the right place, and so on. The function for converting a coordinate to a screen point is fairly straightforward. You do need to know the width and height, or rather size, you could say, of the tile artwork. And you'll then just follow the code that's in the accompanying blog post, and it's just a couple of lines that converts the coordinate to the point on screen. The next thing we're interested in is figuring out if a coordinate is on the screen at any given point in time. And this is where the isomorphic system gets kind of interesting. Again, isomorphic, same thing as 2.5D. So let's start by just acknowledging that there's always a center coordinate, something that's in the middle of the screen. And this is where our happy little player, the hero of Forever Maze, is hanging out. So our scene class has a center coordinate at all points in time. Now, what gets interesting about this is as we increase the y values here, you notice we're not moving directly towards the edge of the screen. In other words, the function for determining what tiles are on screen is not quite so simple as just checking a rectangular bounds. So the code that actually figures out if a coordinate is on the screen is essentially going to use a secondary coordinate as a test coordinate and find the distance between the two by converting them both to points. In this case, we might have this vector, and that's what we essentially end up getting out of using the test coordinate, is the vector expressed in points, which then can be used to calculate based upon its width and height if the coordinate or is on the screen relative to where the player is. All right, next up, the coordinate uh, conversion process also allows for a certain buffer zone. So why this is important is outside the bounds of the screen, we actually want to be able to buffer the data as it's coming in. Forever Maze is an online game. This means that there's data being loaded from a server as you're walking around. So this area around the edge actually represents the space that we want to prepare as the screen is moving so that it is ready by the time the player finishes a step, meaning that what's actually displayed on the screen is always rendered. So in this case, the buffer pixels give us a, allow us to throw an extra parameter into the function 
that's just going to include more of a region around the screen and consider it as being on the screen. It kind of expands the screen by a little bit. Just like buffering a video when you're waiting for playback, the buffer pixels around the edge of the screen ensure that that additional amount of area is loaded. Now, getting on to world wrapping. This is where things get really quite interesting. Let's say that the player here is standing at Y coordinate 99. And we said that the world is 100 by 100, which means that the next tile north, or increasing in the Y direction, is zero, or actually wrapping around. So here, zero, then one, and so on. We might say that this is 50 by 99, this is 50 by zero, that's 50 by one. If we were to look at each of those tiles. So as the player steps north, we don't want this scene here. We don't want things to go all wonky when we cross over the edge of the world. We want to wrap around it smoothly. To do this, we need to first extend our original coordinate to position function. This function is um, needs to really consider the fact that the any tile can actually be drawn at a number of different positions once you introduce world wrapping. That is, Based upon where I am, that 99y position, the zero tile could be drawn here where it is on this screen, or it could be drawn way back here somewhere in space, um, you know, 99 distance to the south, essentially. Um, I hope that kind of makes sense. Like when you when you wrap the world, you're essentially tessellating the world, so you're creating almost copies of it being placed next to each other. And this means that you need to consider that even though this is one in one copy of that world, you're entering into a second one here as you cross over in the Y direction. So that means that all of the tiles uh, that are north of me are actually going to be loaded from the wrapped around version of the world. In order to accomplish this, what I ended up coming up with was a new variable that could be passed into the position, the coordinate to point function, the coordinate to position function. It's the close to center Boolean. When we pass this Boolean, it says, it essentially tells it that we want the coordinate to be converted to a point such that is the closest possible point to the center point of the map, or the center point of the scene at that time. And that guarantees us then that these tiles, as they're being laid out, are always in the correct version, or the correct instance, I suppose you could say. So, so at this point, we now know that our tiles are actually in the right place. That is, when we draw them, we do get to see around the edge of the world, but we're going to get something really strange that happens when we actually make this step from 99 to 0. As that happens, it's going to create kind of a, a jitteriness or a, um, uh, like a seam in the world as you cross over that boundary. The way I fixed this was to essentially redraw the world when the step is happening around the edge. So the player starts at old coordinate and he moves up to the, the new center. So the self dot center will now be a y position of zero or y coordinate of zero. And when we detect that the old coordinate is wrapping around the world relative to the new coordinate, then before the actual animation begins, once the self.center has changed, we can redraw the entire world using 
that function using the uh, coordinate to position function with the close to center set to true, since the center value has now changed, being close to center means that it draws everything again relative to the new state of the world. And doing an instant redraw like this without uh, deallocating objects, but essentially using them, putting them into a cache and redrawing or repositioning the objects, I should say, not necessarily redrawing, but repositioning those uh, that cache of sprites means that we get a seamless wraparound. And then we can animate as normal from this teleported position and the player will actually smoothly uh, move into the new location. So the net effect is if you go and download Forever Maze from the App Store, you'll see that no matter how far you walk, you never encounter a scenario where it feels like you've um, kind of stuttered over the edge of the world. Everything is smooth, everything is even, and there are no seams. And that's how it's done. This coordinate and point system is a pretty, uh, pretty effective way to create a, uh, a world that keeps on going. I hope that all of this has made sense, and I'd really be interested to hear any thoughts or feedback you have on this kind of basic introduction to how I did some of the math in the game. There are going to be a number of other posts about other challenges that I encountered. Certainly there's a lot more um, just kind of math challenges involved with the 2.5D nature of the game. When you twist something by 45 degrees like that, it does uh, kind of uh, tends to throw a monkey wrench in things. So anyways, subscribe to my YouTube channel and you'll get the latest videos as they come out. And also, make sure to check out the accompanying blog post at skillcookbook.com so that you can get all of the source code and more detailed notes. Thanks for watching. Thank you.